Nurse 252 Pathology, Session 4, Acute Inflammation. In this session, we're going to learn about how the body responds to tissue injury. And we will learn about causes, types, and features of the inflammatory process and how the process manifests and is controlled. You will again be learning how the terms are defined and also provide explanations of the features of the inflammatory process. At the end of the session, you should be able to define and classify various types of inflammation, list and explain the five cardinal signs of inflammation, list the systemic effects, describe the changes in inflammation and cells involved and explain the types and mechanisms of formation of exudates. We are going to deal this session under three topics. General features of acute inflammation and its causes, acute inflammatory mechanisms, and then the chemical mediators of inflammation. The reading list is chapter two of the Robbins and Cotran Pathology Basis of Disease, eighth edition. General features of inflammation. The local events that occur when you apply an injurious agent and it leads to uh, changes in the tissue are first, impaired structure and function. The next, the cells may adapt if possible. If they fail to adapt, the next thing that occurs is injury, which may be irreversible. Inflammation occurs when the tissues are damaged irreversibly. The cells die. Then the tissues nearby will become inflamed. The process that occurs next after the inflammation will be healing. And then eventually the area will be restored to some new or normal structure and then the function may come partially or fully. So let's start with inflammation, the definition. The reaction of vascularized living tissue to injury, that is the definition. That inflammatory response has three main functions. First, to bring in material to mediate the local defenses, to destroy or dilute the cause, and to allow the area to heal. So it is essentially a protective process. Its components are the fluid that you get from plasma along with the proteins and cells the wall of the vessel, and then the extracellular material. So what are they? Cells from the blood, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, platelets, monocytes, lymphocytes. Two, cells from the connective tissue, the vascular endothelial cell, mast cell, fibroblasts, and then the extracellular matrix, collagen, uh, elastin and proteoglycans. Let's start with the nomenclature. We've met this in other sessions. The suffix itis, preceded by the name of the organ, is how you give a name to an inflammatory area. For instance, appendix, which is inflamed, will be appendicitis. The stomach lining, when it is inflamed, is gastritis. It is not stomachitis, because it is the Greek word for the stomach that is used, not the English one. What are the patterns? Two main patterns, acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. And in this session, we'll be dealing with acute inflammation. There are two phases, vascular phase and the cellular phase that we'll be concentrating on in this session. Eventually, inflammation is terminated 
This occurs when the mediators are exhausted, the jurors agent is cleared away along with the exudate. What are the causes of inflammation? They are similar to the causes that we dealt with under cell injury. And they are microbial infections, hypersensitivity reaction, physical agents, irritants and corrosive chemicals, and tissue necrosis. How do you recognize acute inflammation? You do that by the cardinal signs of acute inflammation. These are five. The first four were produced by a gentleman called Celsus in the first century AD. And it is redness, which he called in Greek, rubo, or erythema. The next one is heat, or warmth, called color. The third is swelling, or tumor. This comes because of the fluid that moves out into the area. Then pain or dolor. This is what the patient knows best to complain about. Pain is usually due to the edema fluid that goes into the tissues. Some chemicals that we shall come across can also induce pain. Then loss of function. This is well known when you have inflammation, you don't use that part which is inflamed. It was added by Vekov and the movement is restricted either by reflex or by because of the pain. Sometimes the inflammatory fluid makes it impossible for you to move the part. There are systemic effects of the inflammation and these include a fever that is termed pyrexia. You may have constitutional symptoms like malaise, nausea, and vomiting, and reactive swelling of lymph nodes, and then high leukocytes, and then anemia. So let's move to the mechanisms of acute inflammation. Acute inflammation may be defined as the immediate and early reaction of vascularized tissue to an injury. It is rapid in onset and lasts for a few days or hours. The main features are fluid exudate and no matter the cause, the reaction is the same in acute inflammation. So acute inflammation may be termed as stereotyped. There are May, the main events of acute inflammation are changes in the caliber of the vessel so that it becomes bigger, changes in the permeability of the vessels so that more fluid moves out of the vessel, and then the cells within the vessel move out. And the cellular events are leukocyte emigration, chemotaxis, accumulation at the site of injury, and then phagocytosis of the offending agent. What are the causes of inflammation? Again, acute inflammation is caused by infections, toxins, physical activity, chemical reagents, and foreign material, and necrosis from any cause. So for instance, if you have a heart attack, called myocardial infarction, there will be inflammation around it, and then hypersensitivity reaction. What are the events that occur in response to the injury that constitutes inflammation? It starts with transient vasoconstriction, then vasodilatation, three, Increased blood flow into the area. Four, increased permeability with prolonged fluid exudation. Five, increased viscosity of the blood because of the loss of the fluid. This slows down the blood. Six, 
the slowdown of the blood is called stasis and it leads to loss of laminar flow. 7. Margination. 8. Pavementing of leukocytes. 9. Emigration of leukocytes. And then chemotaxis and activation. And then finally, phagocytosis of the offending agent. So let's take some time to briefly go over the changes in vascular flow and caliber. The vasodilatation increases blood flow, and this is the, what results in the heat or redness and redness that we may see in the cardinal signs. There is a mediator called histamine. And this picture illustrates an inflamed foot and an uninflamed foot. The one on the right is uninflamed. And you can see the redness of the inflamed one on the left. This is due to the vasodilatation. The blood within the dilated vessels is what gives the redness. Of course, if your skin is like mine, you will not see it, the redness. You will see black. But if you look into the eye, or if someone like me gets inflammation in the eye, the conjunctiva, the redness can be seen easily. Now, changes in vascular permeability. This is increased permeability. It allows plasma to escape into the tissues. And this is what leads to increased viscosity and slowing of the blood. So the fluid that collects in inflammation and becomes a swelling is because of vascular permeability that increases. So let's say a few more words about the vascular permeability. There are three patterns. The first is immediate transient response that starts very quickly and then is short-lived. Within 30 minutes to one hour, it's gone. The mediator is histamine. And this is due to endothelial cell contraction. The next type, delays in onset. So you have to wait maybe 2 to 12 hours before it will start. It also lasts a couple of days. The example is sunburn. Um, those who get sunburn sometimes move away from the sun, go to bed before the onset of the inflammation. And then they swell up and we have to be rushed to hospital. The third type is immediate sustained response. This is very, when you have very severe injury. So everything is damaged over there. The vessel is damaged. And you get it from severe trauma or a chemical injury or a burn. It affects all the vessels there, artery, vein, and capillary. And the leakage continues until you repair the vessel or you block it by thrombosis. Now let's move on to the mechanisms that lead to the increased permeability. What process leads to it? First is formation of endothelial gaps. This is what leads to the immediate transient response. And the chemical involved is histamine the endothelial cells contract to create these gaps. The next one is retraction. The cells retract under the influence of cytokines. So they move away from each other, reconstruct and reorganize the skeleton of the cells. This is what accounts for delayed and long-lived, as you see in sunburn. Then there is direct endothelial injury that can be caused by severe injury. That one leads to cell death of the vessel wall and it gives the immediate sustained response. Sometimes the leukocytes, neutrophils, can become activated and release toxic enzymes and kill endothelial cells. This is what underlies the leukocyte mediated injury. Sometimes the cell, endothelial cell, can increase transcytosis and lead to 
increase permeability. The final one is leakage from regenerating capillaries. When the new blood vessels are forming in a prolonged inflammatory state, leakage comes from the new immature vessels. So let's move to on to talk about what the cellular events are. They are margination, adhesion, and migration, chemotaxis, and phagocytosis. In acute inflammation, the main cell is the neutrophil. And when it collects, it's called pus. So pus consists of living and degenerate neutrophils together with liquefied tissue debris. This cell goes through the cellular events. The first one is margination. In normal blood flow, cellular components of the blood are in the center part of the blood flow, whilst the plasma is in the periphery. When the blood slows down, it is impossible to keep the cells in the central portion. So by physical forces, they start moving towards the peripheral position. That process of movement towards the peripheral process, uh, portions of the vessel, under the influence of the slow blood flow, is called margination. After they have marginated, they adhere, and there are three distinctive portions of my, uh, adhesion. The earliest is rolling, which is transient. And the next one is adhesion, where they are firmly attached. And then pavementing is when they are, so many of them, of the neutrophils are attached to the vessel wall that it looks like pavement stones within the vessel. Next step is emigration, where the cells actively move through the wall of the vessel from the intravascular compartment to the extravascular compartment. This process occurs in venules. And depending on the type of stimulus, various white cells can move out. In acute inflammation, the usual one to go is neutrophil. But in some conditions, Monocytes may be the ones to go. In viral infections, lymphocytes usually emigrate. And in type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, eosinophils may be the main cell that emigrates. All in an acute inflammatory process. After the cells move out of the vessel, they, they go through chemotaxis and activation. Chemotaxis is defined as unidirectional movement along a chemical gradient. The neutrophils have receptors for various chemotactic agents and these agents bind to these receptors and the neutrophil can know exactly where to go. So for instance, if a bacterium is growing in an area, then the bacterial products will serve as the chemotactic agents they will be denser around where the bacteria are producing them and less dense further away. So as soon as the neutrophil comes out of the vessel, it can know exactly where to go by binding these agents and knowing where they are denser. So the more concentration of the agents they meet, they, then they know that they are going the right direction. Phagocytosis is engulfing of the particle, for instance, the bacterium, by the white cell. There are three phases, recognition and attachment, engulfment, and then the killing and degradation of the bacterium. How do the white cells recognize foreign material? They do that by receptors. They have receptors for organisms, then there are receptors for opsonins. 
the opsonins are proteins and other substances that can bind particles and make them more easy for phagocytosis. And they include antibodies, complement fragments, and others. So the white cells recognize the bacteria or foreign material through these opsonins as a second way of recognition. Once they are recognized, the next step is engulfment. The area where the particle is recognized invaginates into the white cell, and the white cell engulfs. Once the area invaginates, it forms a phagosome. So the particulate material within it can then be destroyed by attachment of lysosomes to the phagosomes to form phagolysosome. Then the lysosomal contents are discharged into the vacuole, the phagolysosome, and then the bacteria will be destroyed. Killing and degradation. Bacterial killing is accomplished largely by oxygen-dependent mechanism. This results from generation of oxygen-derived free radicals. Earlier on, we mentioned lysosome killing bacteria. This is oxygen-independent, and it is not the major way bacteria are killed. The most important way is the oxygen-dependent pathway. Now, following the killing, the lysozymes within the lysosomes and which have been poured can then degrade the bacteria. And if, when the white cell successfully phagocytosis all the bacteria which were creating the disease, then the inflammatory process can come to an end. Now, what we have described in this session so far, all the events that we have described are taking place because of chemicals that are available for the inflammatory process to modulate and control the process. They are large body that are derived from plasma or cells in the blood. The cell-derived ones are basoactive amines, arachidonic acid, metabolites, cytokines, and nitric oxide. And the plasma-derived ones are from the proteases in the blood, the complement system, clotting system, and the kinin system. There are two basoactive amines, histamine and serotonin. And histamine is the most important. It's the most studied mediator it causes endothelial cell contraction and increases permeability of the vessel. Serotonin is a similar functioning substance. It is found in platelet granules. Arachidonic acid metabolites come from new production of metabolites from the cell membrane. Two enzymes act on arachidonic acid and produce various substances. One is cyclooxygenase enzyme. It produces prostaglandins. I've listed some of them. I2, E1, E2, D2. We must pay attention to I2 because it is responsible for normal dilatation of vessels. And E2 this is important for pain and fever. The other enzyme that acts on arachidonic acid is produces leukotrienes and it's called a lipooxygenase enzyme. Some of the leukotrienes are key. For instance, leukotriene B4 is a chemotactic factor for neutrophils. The effects of the leukotrienes are restricted to venules. Other chemicals produced by the cells include cytokines. 
they can be produced by all cells, including macrophages and T lymphocytes. Nitric oxide is produced by endothelial cells and it produces vasodilatation. Then the plasma proteases. These are protein systems that are enzymes and they are proenzymes that are present in the blood. The first one is complement system. When the cascade begins, one protein is cleaved and it becomes an enzyme. And then it cleaves the next, next. Eventually, it produces a membrane attack complex. This sits on blood bacteria, for instance, and can perforate the wall of the bacteria and kill it. Fragments from the complement system act on vessel walls as inflammatory mediators. Examples are C3A and 5A. They cause vasodilatation and increase vascular permeability. Then the kinin system, it's also an important factor present in the blood. It produces bradykinin, which is responsible for smooth muscle contraction, pain, and increased vascular permeability. The clotting system that leads to blood clots is also important. It produces fibrinopeptides in the process of producing the fibrin. This is because thrombin cleaves small peptides from prothrombin and leads to these fibrinopeptides. Your references for this session, chapter 2 of Pathologic Basis of Disease by Rough Prince and Quatran, 8th edition.